Um, so I'm Steve Hallett from Cranfield University, uh, Professor of Applied Environmental Informatics, along with Ron, one of the, uh, d the two digital environment champions for NERC for this project. It's absolutely wonderful to see you all here today. Thank you so much for coming. We now move to a part of the program, which is to hear the voice of experts and stakeholders from uh, the various partner organizations and other organizations who use digital approaches in their work. And so we have a, a panel discussion now and a chance for you to put some questions to colleagues here and then we have some presentations after lunch. We're just gonna push lunch back a, a little bit looking at the, the time at the time of things. But I'm absolutely delighted to uh, invite and to welcome uh, here a number of colleagues. First of all, we have uh, Sally, Sally Brown, uh, the uh, Principal Scientist, uh, Flood and Coastal Risk Management Research from Environment Agency. Thank you very much. And um, we have Mick Whelan. Now, of course, this morning we heard from Isabel Stephen about the SPF programs. I'm delighted to welcome Mick Howick from uh, the SPF Landscape Decisions uh, program, which is, in fact, coincidentally running a, at a conference here in this very room for the next couple of days. And uh, Kate Jill from the uh, Q Science. Thank you, Jill, for coming from Digital Revolution and the priority lead of that. And lastly, Julie Gregory, Senior Program Manager from the Climate Change Task Force at Network Rail. And what I'd like to do is just invite uh, each of the colleagues here to give a, just a few comments, introduce themselves, about, a little bit about their work, and then we'll have a, a discussion. So, um, Kate, may, may I start with, with you and we'll sort of move down the... Okay, you. hopefully you can hear me. Yep, sounds good. Um, so, uh, Dr. Kate Gill, uh, I've come from the Royal Botanic Gardens queue, but I am not a biologist even remotely. Uh, I'm an aeronautical engineer, uh, so basically I'm a data scientist who's done software and that's kind of where my kind of head comes into this conversation. Um, people ask me why I work at Q. This is my fifth government department. Um, and in terms of my conversations, I always come back to like a, a quote that I uh, remember from a, a, a colleague of mine actually who's uh, E.O. Wilson, in, who's an American biologist, who basically said, we're drowning information while starving for wisdom. And that's kind of been my life for the last 40 years in various departments around government. Um, I've landed at Q because I'm leading the dig Digital Revolution Project, um, which is basically um, digitising and capturing anything and everything that moves or doesn't move in Q, uh, including the Millennium Seed Bank in Wakehurst. Um, and that's really what I'm trying to do, is kind of mobilising the data, mobilising the information, and then helping the Q staff and other researchers worldwide to access that and kind of uh, be the really exciting bit, which I'm kind of like looking forward to the next step, which is, right, we've got all this data, now what can we learn from it? And that's the bit I'm getting very excited about now. Thank you very much. So yeah, I'm Julie Gregory. Um, I work for Network Rail as Senior Programme Manager, um, as Steve said, for Climate Change Task Force. So this is a role that was created about um, eight months ago. Um, but I actually got involved with this, uh, this work with one of the, one of the projects um, in my previous role, where I was a sponsor for the Southwest Rail Resilience Programme. A uh, bit of a mouthful, but that basically was looking at um, the piece of railway down in Devon between Dawlish and Tynmouth where you have um, the sea on one side and the steep cliffs on the other side, twin massive environmental threats to, to the railway and it's obviously it's a key link connecting um, the southwest peninsula with the rest of the network. Um, and so I became engaged in the cream tea project as part of that which looks at the overtopping at Dawlish um, and we're looking to use that information to help us you know, respond in real time to um, to you know high tides and overtopping, um, but also to think about what we might need to do longer term um, to kind of make a resilient network. Um, so yeah, it's been fascinating to come along and just hear you know the breadth of the program um, and and lots and lots of insights. I'm particularly um, interested in in the the uh, was it the um, Alessandro's talk, yeah, because because we've got loads of, of cliffs um, and uh, and loads of earthworks that are causing a, a, a threat to the railway. So yeah, loads of really interesting stuff to, to think about. And yeah, um, echoing your point about information is what we need, not data. <laughs> thank you. The, the Sensum project that was, yes, thank you. Sensum. Please. 
Hello everybody, um, my name is Sally, I work at the Environment Agency where I'm in one of the national teams that uh, look after flood risk and I'm particularly interested in research, research needs related um, to flood risk, um, sucking information in and getting it to the right people in the Environment Agency. I've been in my post for a year and so I'm still exploring what the Environment Agency does. One of the things I'm trying to, to do is to start a project on digital technologies. How do we get the right digital technologies to the, into the Environment Agency? So it's been really good to listen today to hear about some of the cross-cutting things that are going on and particularly the processes, skills and techniques as well. So just some thoughts I've had so far listening to today, to today and also um, talking to about 50 different colleagues from around uh, the Environment Agency as well with some of those challenges. Um, first of all, it's about data. Um, there's a lot of data out there, as we've just said again, but trying to get it in the right space is really important. It's also about the data quality, integration of that data, the storing, formatting. There's a lot there, a lot of historical data as well. It's not just what you're picking up now, but how do we actually get that into a friendly and usable, usable way, particularly if you want to use it for different applications like AI, machine learning, how do we actually get that in a comprehensible way? The second thing is, how do we use that data to make a decision? So is it actually lots of data really helpful? Or do we have enough already? And that, again, is a question of affordability. It's a question of the skill sets. It's a question of the visualisation of how we can make decisions quickly and efficiently and effectively. Um, and about the longevity of any model and any data set as well. It's OK running something for the duration of a project, but what happens next? Whose responsibility is it to keep that data alive and to keep that project alive? And then the final point is about the use of ethics, um, the appropriate use um, training as well for staff that may need upskilling. Um, to make sure that we continue to improve what we do. So that's another legacy, um, what I'd really love to hear today as well from, from people with different projects, how we're going to continue that to make sure the data gets to the right users at the right timing so we have the right information to make decisions. Thanks very much. And uh, linking up the SPF projects, Mick. Yeah, thanks, Steve. So th thanks very much for um, inviting me here. Just uh, by good fortune, we, we, as Steve said, happen to be running our final programme uh, meeting right here. Uh, over the next couple of days. If, by way of a plug, if anybody is uh, interested in coming to that meeting, it's a bit late in the day, but there might be a, an opportunity for signing up. So please see me afterwards if you, you're interested in, in coming along. Um, by way of background, my, my, um, I'm based at the University of Leicester. I'm a professor of environmental science. I have a, a background in hydrology and biogeochemical cycles originally, but um, over the last 20 years I've got into synthetic organic con uh, compound fate and behaviour. Um, so I'm, my own research is water quality. Um, the reason why I'm sitting here um, this afternoon is uh, because I am also, also sit, sit on the programme coordination team for the SPF Landscape Decisions Programme. Um, so the, the programme, as you've you probably uh, picked up, is there's a huge overlap. I mean, one of the things that struck me this morning from hearing the, uh, the presentations uh, was the, the, the massive amount of overlap between uh, what's going on in landscape decisions and what's going on in this programme. Um, the the strap line for the programme is towards a new framework for using land assets in the UK. Um, there are 63 inter interconnected projects uh, spanning a very wide range of disciplines. Most of them are interdisciplinary. Um, lots of work on uh, developing new techniques, new mathematics and models and applying models uh, for looking at uh, landscapes. Uh, but also uh, we have a work package uh, which is called New Thinking and Communities, uh, which brings in uh, people into the equation. So thinking about landscapes and landscape decisions, it's really important to remember the people uh, and not get lost in the data and the modelling. Um, a few reflections on what I've heard this morning and maybe overlaps. The th first thing that I think Ron picked up this morning was the ethics and legal thing, and that's really uh, quite important. And I think the last speaker uh, talked about um, drawing data from, sof from software that's used by farmers, and um, that's a very touchy, sensitive um, issue that farmers aren't always that pleased to um, give away their data. Um, you know, there's a lot of commercial sensitivities and legal sensitivities about that. So, you know, when we're talking about um, bringing data um, or, or taking data and using that to make decisions, we, we do have to be very mindful about the legal and ethical considerations. Um, 
Lots of things going on. Uh, the, one of the, the drivers for, I guess, for landscape decisions was, was the, the, the DEFRA 25 year em environment plan, which basically is built around this idea of multifunctional landscapes. So a key concept for landscape decisions is that the landscape is multifunctional. It provides lots of different um, services. Um, traditionally, it was food and fiber production. But over the last 20 years, we've started to become increasingly aware of the other services that are provided by, by landscapes. In the agricultural landscape, there may, may also be disbenefits, so externalities uh, that, that are, are farm, uh, farming, for example, uh, may cause uh, losses of biodiversity, uh, water quality problems, and uh, problems with water quantity. Um, so, um, a lot of what um, is going on in landscape decisions is thinking about multifunctional landscapes, trying to quantify um, ecosystem services. Um, some of those are easy to quantify, some of them are, are less easy to quantify. So, for example, biodiversity itself as a, as a, as a thing to measure is, isn't always that easy to, to, to measure. And, and we've also got other things like uh, cultural services. Uh, that, that are very important, um, you know, what, how people value landscapes, um, that are very difficult to, to incorporate and, and, and into models. And, and so there's a big challenge there, and some projects in landscape decisions have been do, trying to grapple with that challenge. Um, I'm going to show up in a minute. Um, obviously, this leads very strongly into policy, and um, you probably, most of you are aware more than me, uh, that DEFRA are trying to develop a new set of agri-environment schemes around this, uh, this concept of multifunctional landscapes, public good for pu uh, public money for public good, et cetera. And very central to that will be um, collecting the evidence um, for, um, for the benefits that are, that are generated by different lands landscape land uses and, and interventions. And it's really important that we get it right. So uh, data is going to be really important for that. Models are going to be really important. Sensing everything we've been talking about today. Uh, the last thing I'm going to mention that I, I picked up from several talks this morning is um, the value of visualization and interaction and producing software that's actually engaging, that pulls people in. Um, if It's great to do um, all this fancy modeling and data analysis, but if you don't have a user that's actually going to be interested and going to be drawn in, uh, then it's not going to be of much use. So. I think visualization and, and, and software uh, developers have a really important role to play uh, in all of this. So I'll, I'll leave it there and we'll, we'll open it up for one. Yeah, th minutes. thanks, Mike. Uh, no, it's, it's so true. Uh, visualizations are a key key part of this, and there's a very nice example of that. I'm also interested, you mentioned the uh, the ethics and, and so on, and as picking that up. And, I, I just uh, drew uh, my thoughts to the, we did a webinar series, there's another plug for the YouTube channel, by the way. Um, we did a webinar series on the ethics in AI and the intellectual property and bias in AI. And there was some really insightful talks there. It's, it's a fascinating area. So what I'd like to do now is just um, throw, throw out a couple of themes, really, to colleagues here. And uh, I'm hoping we'll have some questions from all of you as well, so you can be thinking of your questions. But maybe we could just start by just put, putting to all of you, really, uh, what, what you think the, you know, the, the advantages, the strengths, the opportunities that digital approaches have in the way that um, organizations like yourselves conduct business. And, and um, you know, what is the art of the possible, in a sense, for, for the, some of the things we're, we're hearing about? Uh, who'd like to have a, a crack at that? Okay. Julie, perhaps? Exactly. <laughs> yes, please do. So, um, well, we need, we clearly do need um, data to drive, to drive our decisions. Earlier I said we don't need data, we need information. We need information to drive our decisions, for that information comes from data, doesn't it? So, um, you know, in, in the rail way, we have to make um, operational, we have to make safety and performance decisions every day, um, you know, and, and very often they're, um, they're not driven partic by particularly robust or comprehensive data so um, you know particularly in the kind of the weather um, resilience space and, and climate adaptation um, we need to make sure that we've got those kind of real data-led um, kind of decision processes um, we, we're constantly balancing two things really in the railway so uh, network rail 
for those that don't know, manages all the infrastructure of the National Rail, Rail Network, and we're constantly balancing safety and performance. So obviously we want to keep um, passengers safe, um, but if we wanted to keep them 100% safe 100% of the time, we wouldn't ever run a train. So um, we have to make decisions um, about performance as well. So we need to um, basically route these, these, uh, these decisions in, uh, in as best data as we possibly can um, so we can balance those two things and, and run trains safely, but also run them as, as reliably as possible as well. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it, it's really... Um, what decisions are is the data going to going to drive, um, and, and that's absolutely key, I think. Thank you, uh, Sally. And, and the Environment Agency, how, how are things done? Yeah, I was going to say health and safety is yes. one of them. Um, if you're out on site or where your limits are, particularly in extreme weather conditions, um, really, really important. Um, it's also about efficiency and how we work. So if we've got a lot of data, do we have the right skills in? Um, again, making sure you're right, the skills in the organisation are correct. So if, if AI can do something, um, you know, can we um, use upskill people in one area to make sure we can use their time effectively? Um, and also, you know, can we avoid doing boring tasks? I think that's the other thing of actually how can we actually be efficient in what we're doing and use um, different, different technologies in different ways to do the things that maybe we don't really want to do. Yeah, that, that's, that's right. Um, Kate, just, just thinking, we, we had a discussion before and I was fascinated to hear about the, the, the span and breadth of all the, the work that you and your team do at Q Science. Um, I mean, what's missing, do you think, at the moment? Uh, technology, skills, onboarding? I mean, is it familiarity of these technologies with management? I mean, what's missing, do you think? Um, I, th I think, uh, thanks for the question, I think in terms of the, uh, the conversation um, we were having, because again I've had different environments and different, different conversations, it's that cultural um, confidence about digital conversations. It's, it's in every job I've been in, it's a case of, oh I didn't know how to write, ask the right question every time, or I didn't know I could do that, or I didn't actually kind of think, oh it's got to be a specialist person who does that. Um, I think collectively, and this community as much as every other digital community I've spoken to, it's just like we all have to have a little bit more confidence in asking the question. Because sometimes you kind of go, I don't know what I don't know, but actually I just need to throw myself into it. So in terms of what's missing, it's, it's that confidence conversation sometimes, and also that kind of acceptance of the fact you're going to fail. Um, my last job, um, I, I failed spectacularly in so many different ways, but I also succeeded. And that's the kind of like that conversation is that sometimes we, we, we're a bit risk adverse uh, in terms of that data conversation, and sometimes you just have to throw yourself into it, and you will learn something for the journey not necessarily the, what you thought you were going to do. So in answer to your previous question about what are we missing, that predictive AI, I always find really interesting conversation because everyone says, well, that's great, AI is going to solve world peace. Uh, it's not because it looks backwards. But in terms of that predictive AI, is we're going to find some stuff that we never thought we didn't know. And we just need to kind of cope with that and have that conversation and then understand why we didn't think we didn't know that, et cetera, that known unknown kind of conversation piece. And just have a little bit more comfort with that. I think that's one of the real things that I think is missing. Mm, thanks. I mean, I, I think the, 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 we, you talked about the convergence, really, of, of some of the things that you're, some of the themes you're looking at and, and, and what you've heard here today. I mean, just, you know, wh wh where are we going with this? What's, what's the future for, uh, for these sorts of digital approaches and looking at things like land, landscape decisions? Where, where do, where do, where do the, these technologies fit in? Where is it going? Well, I think maybe just go back a little bit, I just, just to reflect a little bit on how far we've come um, you know, thinking back to when I first started in, in environmental science, you know, how hard it was to get data, um, how little data there was out there. Um, now we are, it is absolutely amazing. I mean, when you, when you reflect on the technology that's in our pockets, that's in our homes, the, the computational power on our desktops compared to the computational power that we had um, only a few years ago, I, I distinctly remember um, when we got a, a, a machine that had a gigabyte of, not a memory, of, of a gigabyte hard disk. And uh, we were thinking, no one's ever going to use a gigabyte. How can you? And, um, and of course, how things have come along. So I, I think we are now in a position with the technology of sensing technology, particularly remote sensing. It is unbelievable that, that, that this space-based technology is now at everyone's fingertips um, and many of these data sets are, are you know open source and, and are available to everyone so I think that is absolutely incredible 
Um, I think going forward, I think there's so much opportunity to use these data um, to gain insight. So it's all about getting the insight. You know, we've got a lot of data, a lot of numbers flying around. We're drowning in information, but we're, um, we, we're, we're scarce of knowledge. Um, I think that's very, very poignant for, for this conversation and, and, and a key thing. We want to try and get insight. We want to learn something from the data. And key to that is to be mindful that the data do need to be quality controlled um, and there, de there needs to be a, um, you know, some work done on, on making sure that data are consistent. I think Matt uh, mentioned that, that data are um, being collected by a whole a range of different organisations, made perhaps using different methods and aren't always comparable. So that's one thing. That, that I think we need to be mindful of. Um, it's very easy just to throw numbers into an AI uh, and we get nonsense, nonsense in, nonsense out, et cetera. Um, but I think that the, 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 the potential is tremendous for gaining insight from all of this data. Um, I'd like to see, um, and it's happening, more um, in situ sensors, uh, for example, for greenhouse gas emissions, but also for water quality. Um, part of the sort of or an outcome from the, the recent um, outrage about water companies spilling uh, raw sewage um, into, uh, into our rivers is that combined sewer overflows will be much more uh, heavily monitored uh, in future. Uh, and that will degenerate a whole a set of very, very useful data. So um, I'm looking forward to, to seeing more, more sensors being used, also to seeing the data being um, provided in you know, the right format, um, in, a, in an open access format. Um, I can't remember the, the, the phrase I quite liked at the beginning. Um, somebody mentioned, um, oh, I wrote it down. Analysis ready is one of these phrases. That was, that was it, and that, that was it. Analysis ready, I quite like that. So analysis ready data sets um, with good metadata so that they're, you know, they're easy to use um, and, and, and quick, quick to use. Um, so that, 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 that's, I think, within our grasp. I think we, we're definitely able to do that now, and I'd like to see a little bit more of that. Um, so I'll stop there. Yeah, the, print, the principles of sort of fair data sets, uh, that's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, this is something that's really emerged, hasn't it, in the last few years, and the, the emergence of curated, described, analysis-ready data sets, vast bodies of data through um, centres like CEDA, and, and the, the Jasmine supercomputer and Daphne colleagues in the, the audience from both of those facilities um, is, is a, a you know extraordinary development. Um, I also actually should just note that this is capturing that insight that you meant from the data is, is a key factor in the uh, NERC digital strategy, which is something we should all have a look at. I think there's an opportunity now to ask you to pose some questions to our panel members. So who'd, who'd like to start proceedings with a, with a question for our colleagues here? You put your hand up, and if you'd like to say who you, who you, who you, who you are, and thank you. Hello, my name is Rachel Shacross. I uh, come from the Marine and Fisheries Directorate within DEFRA um, as part of the digital strategy team. Um, I'm interested in understanding how you determine your baseline on which to build your evidence platform. Um, if you start from today, we've already had a lot of degeneration. And so therefore, if you're going onwards from there, then how do you determine how well you're improving a system? If you start from a long time ago, you may not have the data sufficient to give you that um, quality base, uh, baseline. Thank you. So thanks very much. Baselining it. Who'd like to have a, a crack at that? <laughs> can, can I start? I, I, yes. Just quickly, I, I think that's a really great question. Because um, if you're going to track progress over time, you need to know where you started from. And um, sometimes we do have um, good data um, already, but not always. Um, so I can't really answer the question, but I think it's a good point that, that, that's well made that... that Quite often, we don't we don't spend enough time thinking about how we're actually going to measure progress over time. One of my big frustrations in the in the sort of water quality world is is an obsession with interventions uh, without proper um, 
you know, um, measurement of the effect of the intervention. So the intervention itself is the, is the good, not the actual outcome. And it's the outcome that we really want to achieve. And we need to monitor the outcome. We need to be able to um, measure the outcome and track that over time. So it's a good point. Hmm. Thank you, Mike. I think we've got time for a, a couple of quick questions before we break for lunch. Um, please, at the back. Thank you. And did I see the second one over there, John? Yes, thank you. Please. Hi. Um, I'm Elizabeth Cowdery. Um, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the James Houghton Institute. Um, uh, I do uh, data synthesis with models. Um, and I'm responding to the comments about visualization and also earlier um, thoughts on essentially how does uh, digital develop um, with the natural uh, research. And um, I was thinking about how often we start with thinking, uh, with working with data sciences, we think about how we have to tell our story, we make our figures, uh, we have to work with people who um, know how to interact with policy. Um, but these days, there are so many more fields, things like uh, user interface, UI, user experience, uh, UX studies, uh, web design, app design. If I were to design a new project, uh, I could have a whole new area of team members who do all of these different things. Can you imagine projects moving forward that would include this entire new area of all these new people uh, just focusing on these areas to help move digital, the digital aspect of the research forward and help us support this side um, so that the data science can focus on what we do best, even with the same, say, monetary resources that we have. Mm, okay, thank you. Uh, Kate, Kate you, you have programs of capturing vast amounts of data from all of the money samples and, uh, and so on at Q. And, Visualization of this to support the science must be key. I mean, how, how are you approaching yeah, visualization of all these? That. That's a fantastic question, and I was, I was desperate to answer it, so thanks for giving me the <laughs> um, So, yeah, Keen and Whitecast, we, we clearly have a lot of uh, customer interaction, and, and that kind of inclusion conversation is, is really, really forefront. How do we tell the story? How do we tell it the story of the data in a way that lands with those communities? both in the UK and worldwide. And then also the visual kind of web-based interface conversation as well in multiple languages, in multiple ways. Um, how do we actually get that conversation? Because we've got some very, very informed citizen science communities now, um, a lot more, I would say, um, than we had a few years ago. And I think if COVID brought us one thing, it's brought us that community that sit at home and actually engage. We have a huge amount of those that, that engage with Q. So we're being challenged constantly all the time as to is it a video? Is it AI? Is it an augmented reality? Is it, we, we're currently doing that and, and trying lots of different things in Q now. Uh, we've just employed some, some uh, augmented reality specialists for exactly that reason, because we need to tell the stories in the way that lands. Um, and actually that's a really important part about the data. So, so although we're doing what we're doing in the project, and I'm, I'm very fortunate that I'm actually in, a, in, a, in the middle of a, a four year project that's funded at the minute, um, my biggest concern is what happens in two or three years' time when that, that drops off the cliff. So the, the, I don't, don't, don't think I've solved everything on this conversation. It's more of a case of totally recognising what you've said about how do we actually employ the specialists to tell the stories. Um, there was a digital comms person that I employed about six or seven months ago who's now done some amazing things that I would never even have thought about thinking about, let alone actually put into place. And it's only because they came in with a completely def different set of eyes and said, well, why are you not doing this? I thought, again, for me, it's just like, yeah, I didn't even know I could ask that question. So, so I'm challenged in that environment as well. And I think the more different skills you can bring into a conversation, the, the more kind of opportunity you have for that data exploitation. So thanks for a fantastic question. It's the public interface to the data science, isn't it? It's the, uh, and if you're doing it public engagement, and it's absolutely crucial. Uh, so I think we have one last uh, question before we break, please. Yeah, hello, uh, I'm Ryan Creeth. I'm a PhD student at Cranfield. Um, I had a question about um, kind of using this data rather than just having this huge, these huge data sets, but actually using it. You know, it requires a lot of computational power. And one of the things that kind of I've been reading about is that the UK kind of compared to places like the US lacks this kind of capacity for compute, the kind of the hardcore data crunching. Um, how much of an issue is this for your um, kind of respective areas, and um, how do you think it can be solved in the future? So uh, access to compute. Well, yeah, like the 
sorry, just to clarify, yeah. Yes, access to um, kind of supercomputers super and the kind of things that are like, particularly like AI-based analysis, the kind of okay. high-level um, systems. Okay, yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Do the, how did the, the Environment Agency and Network for it all deal with uh, supercomputers, do you? I mean, no, Network Rail with the new measurement trainer collecting terabytes of data, absolutely extraordinary amounts of data. And um, I was lucky enough to go on the train and saw this huge amounts of data being pulled off and actually processed before the train had even stopped. And all the processing was actually going on on the train. But where does that data go? And how is it, how, is it supercomputers used for? Yeah, I mean, I used to work for the Met Office and we had supercomputers, but um, I have no idea if Network Rail has supercomputers. I, I would think probably not. Um, and, and I think that's, it, it's really good to hear, um, you know, that at the cutting edge of data research and data science is, is all of this thinking about what do we do with these huge amounts of data that we're now being able to um, download from various places and, and, and the next steps, you know, of how we make them usable. Um, I, I can't pretend to know what network rail does, I'm afraid, but I just think it's, um, it, it's really key to kind of talk to the, uh, the ultimate users and, um, you know, trying to get that post-processing into the most usable form possible. Yeah, I think, I think the, um, the data opportunities are, are, are fairly significant. And, you know, I was also lucky to go to the, the, the data centre in, in, down in Bath, Environment Agency. I mean, the Environment Agency are also collecting and dealing with huge data, data resources. Are, are supercomputers super used in, in, in do, you, do you know? I mean... I don't know. No, uh, I don't uh, know the details there. And I, I, th I think uh, modelling some of the, the flows for in the North Sea, I've, I've spoken with colleagues in the Ipswich office, and I think there are circulation models that do use supercomputers, but it's... It's you know that it's interesting to know how we how we actually give access to some of these uh, these platforms. Really, I don't know, Mick, if you have any thoughts on. I'd, I'd like to just put the question out to the audience: Do yeah. do people think that that computing resources in the UK are lagging behind the U, the US? And you know, is there a need for additional re resource in this area? Can we have a show of hands? Do people feel like it's a constraint? I guess it depends on where you're coming from, but uh, there's a few people. I mean, there must be a few people who think, well, you know, I only need a, you know, a, a desktop, <laughs> laptop computer. I can run everything on that. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I guess it's, I guess it's sort of context specific. I know the Met Office have allegedly um, very high performance computing facilities. Probably other organisations that that also have that, but um, maybe generally across the board, that's not the case. Do we have colleagues from uh, from Jasmine and uh, from Daphne here. Just please, a uh, quick thought from you, and then we'll break. Hi, uh, I'm Matt Pritchard from the Jasmine team at RAL. Um, and uh, yeah, I suppose I can I can talk a little bit um, from the point of view of Jasmine, but also um, the CEDA, the Centre for Environmental Data Analysis, which is sort of run from the same same team. So one of the interesting things there is that. Um, you know, whereas we started with a service that allowed people to download data from what was the British Atmospheric Data Centre and the NERC Earth Observation Data, data Centre, that grew into the, the CEDAR archive covering not just those disciplines but also sort of climate model data. And, and it's been really interesting to see how, with the advent of Jasmine, it's not just about providing the data, it's also providing um, a platform, a, a sort of collaborative space where people can come together and do do their stuff collaboratively and that's a really important part of of providing some of those um, big facilities that it's not just the data and, and the compute power and that sort of thing it's actually the the interactions that happen between groups between scientists between disciplines even um, and and facilitating that to happen thanks very much matt and um with, with daphne i think the daphne user conference is just coming. it might just be time for people to sneak in uh, to the <laughs> let, let's hope um uh, yeah, okay, uh, just a quick quick one and then we'll... Yeah, I, well, it's just a follow-on from this about user needs for HPC and things. I, from my point of view, I feel like we're quite well served for heavy number crunching. You know, we have lots of big supercomputers in the UK that do a great job for that. From, from my point of view, and I don't know if others feel the same, I feel like there's a bit of a niche in the middle between desktop or local servers and the very heavy stuff. Something in the middle to 
you know, where you can play around with data, analyze data sets, et cetera. Things like the Synodes on Jasmine or the cloud offerings, I feel like there could be more done in that space. I think that's, that's a bit of a gap that we have, personally. Yeah. Thanks, Matthew. Right, colleagues, I think uh, much as we'd like the discussion to go on here, there's plenty of discussion over lunch. Uh, we'll break now, and um, you'll notice the exhibitions are all there. Please take the opportunity to talk to the teams who've kindly...